Jesus, we declare that your name is beautiful. Your name is wonderful. Your name has power and authority over all things. And so God, today, this morning, as we come before your presence, uh, we worship you and we place ourselves under your rule and your authority because you are the true king and you are one that has power and authority over all things. And so God, uh, we, we just say, here we are. We are your children and we desire to be in your presence and we desire to encounter you today. And so God, I, I ask that the, you will meet with us today. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence into this place uh, to fill it. We invite your presence into our hearts to fill it. Would you begin to awaken our ears to hear? Would you begin to awaken our soul to comprehend and so that we will encounter you and experience transformation? God, I pray for myself. May I not simply be a speaker of your word. God, you know that's so easy. But I pray, God, that may each day of my life I live out the words that you embed in my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Martin uh, Lindstrom is a former marketing uh, research expert and an author of the book called Brand Wash. And in his book, Brand Wash, he suggests that uh, advertisers know something about human beings that we have in common with birds and termites. Really? Yes. <laughs> that we have something in common with birds and termites. Because in his book, he suggests that like birds and termites, we humans respond similarly. Because it will almost seem as if birds and termites all operate with one mind. In fact, researchers have shown that termites actually respond to whatever their neighbor is doing. And so if the neighbor is running, they respond and run. And so by seeing this, he begins to realize that, yes, not only does that affect termites, but it also affects birds as well, and it also affects us humans as well. In fact, in several researches, it says that human beings are most likely to make decisions based on what their neighbor does and what they do. And so their neighbor's thoughts and the neighbor's actions will impact the way that they make decisions with regarding to how they walk, what music they listen to, and even the choices that they make in their life. In fact, psychologists call this phenomenon peer pressure. And advertisers know the power and the persuasion of peer pressure. In fact, they have it down to a science that, that they know that if they're able to catch what your neighbor is doing, most likely you will respond in the same way. In fact, if you think of the modern day commercials, specifically beer commercials, did you know that beer commercials were aimed at men? And when you watch beer commercials, most of the time, it is what they're trying to do is telling us the simple message that if you drink this beer, you'll be a real man. And so what they're really selling isn't just a beer product. They're selling this image of masculinity. And so that if you want to be a real man, then you drink this beer. Well, likewise, take the cosmetic products, for instance, which aims for the female audience. If you look at most cosmetic ads, they often have a picture of a model who is beautiful and thin. But what they sell isn't just the product. What they're selling is aspiration and escapism. Because what they're trying to do is saying that if you put on this product, it will satisfy your pleasures and it will make you feel better about yourself. And not only will it make you feel better of yourself, it will cause you to appreciate your, your sexual appeal and, and your feminine appeal and your social appeal. What they're selling really is telling us that, that we need these things. Now take for instance the, the generation that we live in right now. Did you know that the generation that we live right now, they took out the word ordinary from their dictionary? You don't believe me? Just look at what's around in social media. Everything about this generation now is about extraordinary. The meals that you have needs to be extraordinary. It needs to be Instagram uh, worthy, right? Uh, the friends that you have, it needs to be quiz essential. In fact, the sunsets that you watch needs to be transcendental. And so, in fact, it's all about being extraordinary. Everything has to be great. It has to be perfect. Take for an instance, the engagement. What once was a private affair between two people now takes a whole village to pull off. Now, you don't believe me? The modern day 
engagement. You need a photographer, you need a videographer, and you need a village to be there to witness it. And in, the more public it is, the more outrageous it is, the more Instagram worthy and Facebook worthy it is, then you have a perfect engagement. Uh, don't get me started on promposals. What this tells us is this, is that all these things tells us that the life that we have now isn't good enough, that we need more. Not only do we need more, if we don't have more, then our life really sucks. And all of this drives us to tell us, the more that we have, the better that we'll feel. Or if we only had this, then everything will be better. But as infectious as peer pressure is, it is also insinuous. Because what it does is that it calls us to long for more things. It, calls, it infects our soul by really robbing us of joy of what we have and making us feel that what we have is never enough. So what do you and I do when the things of this world tells us that we need more in order to experience joy? <laughs> what do we do when peer pressure, the pressure of this world, tells us that we need more and robs us of our joy? I believe that the, if we want to experience joy unleashed in our life, and we need to look at Christ. Our sermon series, Unshackled Joy Unleashed, is a sermon series designed through a study of the book of Philippians to help us to experience joy in all situations and circumstances. Now, most of us have gotten a fairly good grasp of the book of Philippians. We know that the book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul when he was in prison in Rome. Uh, it was probably one of the most difficult and most trying times of his life. And even in that, he teaches the believers in Philippi how to experience joy. But in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul takes a moment to address a very important issue that has taken place in the church of Philippi. In fact, this issue had reached his ears that he's gotten ticked off and he wants to make sure that the people hear what is going on. Because what happens is that there were some Jewish Christians that came from Jerusalem. And they went to the church in Philippi, and they would begin to teach. And they would begin to say, hey, believing the way that you're living right now isn't good enough. Believing in Jesus, that's good. But what would be even better is if you follow all the Mosaic law, if you follow all the dietary law, if you obey all the Jewish holidays, then you would be a really good Christian. And so the Apostle Paul, hearing this, he specifically writes these verses to address the issue. Uh, take a look with me from verse 1 to verse 3. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write such things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of flesh. For it was we who are circumcision. We who serve God by spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. And so the Apostle Paul starts off right away. He's already aggravated. He's already upset. He's already frustrated. And he uses quite strong words. He calls these people dogs, mutilators of flesh, evildoers. Because what these Jewish Christians were doing from Jerusalem they were basically saying to the believers, listen, it's great that you believe in Jesus, but you need to be circumcised and you need to follow all the dietary laws. Because if you're not, then your faith isn't good enough. And so the Apostle Paul heard this and he's upset and he begins to use these words to tell the believers in Philippi, these guys are no good. They're up to no good. And what they're telling you is no good. And so what the Apostle Paul is so upset because these Jewish believers were teaching something called Jesus Plus. Many of us are thinking, what the heck is Jesus Plus? Is Jesus Plus the latest upgrade? Is Jesus Plus the, the latest model in which how Jesus is displayed? No. Jesus Plus is a mentality that says, it's good that we have Jesus, but we need more if we want to experience better things. And so the Jesus Plus model basically says this is that, yes, it's good that I believe in Jesus, but it would be even better if I had a better job. I, 
It'll be even better if, if I had a wife. It'll be even better if my wife actually listened to me and, <laughs> you know, uh, it, if we even had a great marriage. It'll be even better if I had kids. So it'll be even better if my kids actually listened to me. It'll be even better if I had a, a great job. It'll be even better if my health was better. It'll be even better if I had better friends. And so what this basically tells us is that Jesus isn't enough. And so to have a Jesus plus mentality, it basically tells us that Jesus isn't enough, that in order for us to experience joy, then we need all the other stuff. In fact, if you think about it, this is what the world tells us. The world today tells us it's, it's okay you have your Jesus or you have your religion. It's not a problem if you have your Jesus or your religion. But you need this. You need, you need to own a house. You, you, you need to be married and have 2.3 kids now, uh, and a dog and a cat maybe. Right? You, you, you need to have your 401s. You need to have a retirement plan. You, you need to have friends. And you know what? Not only do you need to, you have to dress a certain way, you have to look a certain way, you have to act a certain way. In fact, not only is the world saying that, but people in the church are saying that that you need Jesus plus, right? You need Jesus plus. You, 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 you need this and you need that. You've got to have this. Your kids need to go to the best schools. You need to uh, graduate from the best colleges. The same message that we hear constantly. In fact, some of us even believe that it's Jesus plus my sins, that I have Jesus and I can still continue sinning the way that I want. I can still continue to be a jerk or an idiot. I can still continue to... Uh, live in my lust. I can still live in my anger. I can still live in my bitterness and I can still live in my unforgiveness because I got Jesus, but it's okay if I hold on to these pluses. The reality is that pluses doesn't add to our life. The pluses subtract from our life because what the pluses do is it removes joy from our life. Because no matter how many pluses that we have, it is never enough. No matter how many pluses that we desire to seek after and pursue, it will never be enough. And when that infectious Jesus plus mentality takes over in our life, we feel depressed because whatever we have, we'll never really enjoy because we want more. Whatever we have experienced, we'll never enjoy because we want more. We're, and not only does the Jesus plus mentality infect us in wanting more, it forces us to compare. Oh, look at that person. They got that. Oh, look at this person. They got that. What about me, Jesus? And so when we have the Jesus plus mentality, here's a joy robber. When it infects our soul, it devastates our soul, and it robs us of any ounce of joy that we have. And so the Jesus plus mentality, it's a, it's a virus that infects all of us. Because we feel that having Jesus is not enough. And guess what? The Apostle Paul learned this the hard way. Look what he says in verse 4 through verse 6. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else that think they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the Lord, law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. You see, the Apostle Paul learned the hard way that pursuing the pluses of life wasn't it. Because he was a person who had all the pluses. He just told us that he had all the pluses. He was a Jew of Jewish people, Hebrew of Hebrew. Do you know how hard it is for people in Jewish time, Jesus' time to actually trace their lineage? Because after the exile, most people didn't even know their lineage. And so here it is. Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That basically means that my parents were Jewish before you were Jewish. My parents observed the law and they circumcised me on the eighth day. They were God-fearing people and they obeyed the Torah to the letter of the law. So I was circumcised on the eighth. So my lineage is already a religious rich history. Not only does he say that, he basically says, guess what? I'm from the right race too, because I am from the tribe of Benjamin, right? For, 
You say you have education? He says, I got education too. Guess what? I am a Pharisee. You think you are religious? I am a Pharisee. Not only am I a Pharisee, guess what? I study under the top rabbis. And then he begins to say, hey, you think you have zeal? You think you love God? Guess what? I love God so much that I persecuted the church because I thought that they were a bunch of traitors. I was there when Stephen was stoned. I was there when I dragged those women out of their houses. And you think you obey the law? According to the law, I was faultless. You want to talk about prestige? You want to talk about pluses? The Apostle Paul says, I had them all. The Apostle Paul was on a track to success beyond success. Not only was he on a track to be success beyond success, he came from the right lineage. He came from the right financial background. He came from the right religious background. He had all the pluses. And so the Apostle Paul says, yes, I had all the pluses. But he learned the hard way. The pluses in life wasn't enough. The pluses in life didn't give him joy. The pluses of life only rob them of joy. Just look what he says here in verse 7. But whatever were gain to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And the Apostle Paul says this, when I encountered Jesus on the road of Damascus, I realized all of my pluses were actually minuses. It didn't fulfill me. Everything that I was pursuing my whole life didn't fulfill me. It wasn't until I encountered Jesus Christ that I began to realize all the gain, all the pluses that I pursued, all the things that I chased after, all the things that people told me that I needed to have in order to be joyful, in order to feel valued or loved or a sense of purpose. It's garbage. And it's a very interesting Greek word that he uses. In fact, this is the only time in the, New Te in, in the Bible that we actually see this word, this Greek word being used. The word that the NIV translates as garbage is very mild and censored and tamed. In fact, the word garbage basically means an animal poop. The Apostle Paul wanted to use a word that was so in contrast in what he felt all of his accomplishment was and all of his prestige pluses was, because guess what? He had a lot. And he wanted to put into perspective for people to understand this, that how worthless all of it was. And so he uses a word that, that was disgusting, have no value whatsoever, and so he uses animal poop. And so the Apostle Paul says, all the pluses that I've attained in my life, all the pluses I thought I needed, they're as worth as animal poop. Because in comparison with encountering Jesus Christ, they were worthless. In comparison with encountering Jesus Christ, they were worthless. They have no value. They have no meaning. They have no substance. So when the Apostle Paul encountered Jesus, something dramatic happened. In encountering Jesus, he began to experience joy that was unleashed. In his encounter with Jesus Christ, he realized that everything that he had ever pursued after was poop. That the only thing of value, that the only thing that actually unleashed joy in his life was Jesus and not only did he realize that, he gave his whole life in pursuit of it. He gave his whole life in pursuit of having more of Jesus in his life. Because this is what the Apostle Paul says in verse 10. It says, I want 
to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his suffering and become like him in death. In verse 11, and to somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. The Apostle Paul says, I know that all of my pluses in the past are as worthless as poop, but I know what is of great value. I know what will unleash joy in me. I know what will bring value and worth and identity and purpose in my life. That is knowing Jesus Christ. And he says this, I want to know. I want to know the power. I want to understand his suffering. Many of us, when we think about that, we'll be very honest and say, that's not often our desire, is that we want to know Christ on that level. We want to know Christ more intimately than we actually know our wives or our husband. We want to know Christ more intimately than we actually know ourselves. Most of us just said, nah, as long as I have Jesus as my backup plan, it's all good. But if Jesus, if Jesus, if it, if Jesus is not, is not the only thing, if all we're seeking is Jesus plus, guess what? Our life will always be miserable. It will never be enough because we will never be satisfied. We will never be content with whatever God does in our life, whatever God gives in our life. We'll never be patient in waiting for Him to act. All we will ever want is more. And if that's you and me, guess what? That basically says that we're not content with Jesus. And if we're not content with Jesus, basically says that we really don't know Jesus. Because Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to experience his power. I want to participate in his suffering. I want to know him so well that, that I want to be in sync with him. That's the only way that joy is going to be unleashed in our life. That is the only way for you and I to experience joy. Because the pluses of life, it is infectious. And it robs us of joy. Not only does it rob us of joy, it shackles us up in bitterness. Because whenever we feel that we do not have enough, we're going to feel bitter. We're going to feel bitter about the circumstances that we have. And not only are we going to be bitter, we're always going to be comparing. And not only are we going to be comparing, we're going to be envious and jealous. And when that happens, we're just basically saying, God, you have cursed me. Whatever I have is not enough. But in order for us to experience joy unleashed, We need Christ. We need more of Jesus in our life. We need more of Him. We don't necessarily need more people. We don't need to pray more. We don't need to read the Bible more. We don't need to go to church more. What we need is we more, need more of Jesus in our life. We need more encounters with Him. We need to hear His voice more. We need to experience the intimacy of what it means to know Him. And when that happens, joy will be unleashed. When we were in the process of planting this church, I would say that uh, there was a season of excitement, but there was also a season of great depression. And I remember very vividly, this is, uh, this is about, uh, I would say, Jan. Uh, probably December or November of last year. And we've been trying to work at this church plant, trying to get it off the ground for a while now. And, you know, we were telling the, I was telling the people at my church, yeah, yeah, I'm going to church plant. It's been two years already, and nothing's happening. People aren't buying in. People don't want to come. People don't want to join up with us. Uh, people didn't want to even be a part of a church plant. People didn't even want a part of anything. 
And at this time, my, my life is all spread out everywhere. I, I'm teaching in the seminary. I, I'm working. I'm part-time. All my life is chaos because everything's split apart. And so I began to make a radical choice that, yeah, I'm going to leave the seminary. I'm going to leave my teaching position as well. I'm going to begin to transition into church planting full-time, and here it is. Okay. In the beginning, we thought we had no money. Okay, God was coming through with some money. But now what we needed was we needed people, and we had very few. And so I was utterly depressed. I was bitter. I was angry. I was yelling at my wife who was pregnant at that time. I was frustrated at her because I was just so angry and I was just so bitter. I was bitter at how come people can attract people so much? How come people can just grab people? Maybe, maybe they're great and maybe I'm a loser. Maybe just people just don't like me. And so here I, I'm utterly depressed. I'm bitter. I'm frustrated. And I'm wondering how come God isn't blessing me? I'm frustrated to the point where I say, God, I don't even want to talk to you. Right? You call me. I put my life on the line here. Right? I have a baby and I have another one coming. God, this is it. And I'm so frustrated. And finally, around January, yes, the pastor doesn't pray always. Finally, in January, I hit a point where I'm just so beaten up and so bitter and so frustrated and so angry and I'm sitting before my computer and it's in the morning after the kids are, are at school and my wife's at school and I'm sitting before my computer and I began to say these simple words come Jesus come I had no words to pray I don't know how to pray. I don't know which direction to go. I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm bitter, I'm lost. And I know that I was in not a good state. I wasn't a, peop a person that people wanted to be around because my soul was all bent out of shape. I was filled with so much rage and anger and frustration. I didn't know what to say to God. I didn't know what to do. But all I knew was I was beginning not to like myself. And so here I'm sitting before the computer, and the only words that came out of my mouth were, come, Jesus, come. And I just kept on repeating, come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come, because I had no answer for what was going on in my heart. I had no answer what was going on outside of my life. And so the only words that I could say was, come, Jesus, come, because somewhere deep down in me, I knew that I needed more of Jesus that he will make sense of whatever is going on. So I just asked, come, Jesus, come. And I'm repeating it this time now. And finally I said, okay, God, I, I really need to get myself in that posture because I need you. And so I said, come, Jesus, come. And I began just to open my palm and I said, come, Jesus, come. I just need to encounter you. And I began to say these words, come, Jesus, come. I began to experience the presence of God to fill my heart, to fill my mind, to fill my soul. The tension I felt in my body was beginning to loose up. The anger that I had in my heart was beginning to be subdued. The frustration that I had, the bitterness I had, were beginning to be re replaced by tears. And as I began to say, come, Jesus, come, I began to weep before the Lord. I said nothing else besides, come, Jesus, come. And somehow, as God was doing something supernatural in my heart, God was beginning to take away the bitterness and begin to heal the brokenness in my soul. And as that was beginning to happen, joy was beginning to be unleashed. Not only was joy being beginning to unleash, but a new vibrancy, a new source of energy was beginning to take off in me to say, we can do this. For many of us, all we want is Jesus plus. And what I'm telling you is this. Jesus plus is not having Jesus at all. Jesus plus is really subtracting Jesus from the equation because we want the plus more than Jesus. The reality is this. If we want to experience joy unleashed in our life, it can only come through 
Jesus. It can only come in Jesus and Jesus alone. Nothing else. Not your boyfriend, not your husband, not your wife, not your finances. Not having your situations resolved. It can only come through Jesus. It may be the reason that we're depressed. Maybe the reason that we're frustrated in our life. Maybe the reason we're not experiencing peace and joy in our life is this. It's because we want the plus more than Jesus. But imagine along with me that the pluses in your life no longer matter. Imagine in, my, in your life that you are at peace with whatever stage and situation that you are at. Imagine you actually have joy when the situations and circumstances of your life aren't doing well. Imagine you actually experience cheerfulness even when the world around you is crumbling. Imagine if you were at peace even though your life was rumbling and shaking. That will only come when we seek Jesus and Jesus alone. And so maybe for us, maybe what it is going to take is for us to utter those simple words. Come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come. Jesus, come in my brokenness. Jesus, come in my depression. Jesus, come into my anxiety. Jesus, come into my marriage. Jesus, come into this frail, broken body of mine. Jesus, come in the depressing job that I live, work in. Jesus, come and resolve the heartache and the brokenness that I experience in my life. Jesus, come. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up right now. And maybe this is what we need to say today. For some of us, we probably never utter it. We just simply say, God, you do whatever you want to do. And that's our prayer. But maybe our prayer should be this. Come, Jesus, come. Here I am, all of me. And I place it at your feet. I ask that you remove the pluses. I ask that you take my eyes off the pluses, the things that I feel that I absolutely need in order for me to be happy, to be joyful. And just give me you. Because when we say, Jesus, come, we're opening the door, saying, please come in and rule and reign. Today, as we're about to take the communion, we're reminded of what Jesus did. Jesus died for us. Jesus paid for our sins. Jesus brings restoration to all of our brokenness. And when we take the bread and we take the cup, we are also saying, come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come into my life. Come, Jesus, come into all of my brokenness and be Lord. Because when you are Lord, you are responsible, God. That's what we need to say. That's what we need to do. And so as you're getting yourself ready to prepare your heart for communion, maybe the only words that you need to say before you get yourself ready, is come, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus, come in, into the brokenness of my life. Come, Jesus, come into the sins of my life. Come, Jesus, come into my marriage. Come, Jesus, come in, 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 into the things that, that has hurt me and broken me. Come into my bitterness. Come into my depression and come into my anxiety. And take responsibility. On the night before Jesus Christ was going to be crucified on the cross, he was in the Passover meal and he was in the presence of his disciples and he was taking the Passover feast. He broke the bread and he took, and he took the bread and he showed his disciple and he's broken. He says, this is my body that was broken for you. 
This is my body that was broken for you. Take it and eat it. Then he took the cup and he said, This is my blood that was poured out for you. And so, as you and I are getting ourselves ready to take the communion, just welcome Jesus and say, Come, Jesus, come. Here's all of my situation. Here's all of my circumstances. Here's my bitterness. Here's my anger. Here's my frustration. Here's the brokenness of my life. Here are the things that I feel that I absolutely need to have. These are yours. You take responsibility. That's what we're doing when we say, Jesus, come. We're saying, God, we trust that you are going to be responsible. So whenever you're ready, help yourself in partaking the bread and the cup. Because when you do, remember, Jesus has taken full responsibility 